Hey everybody, hope you guys are having a good day. I am very excited to hop on and talk to you guys about this today. Um, man, God has just been giving me downloads on this particular topic for like the last, gosh, three days maybe now. Um, and it's the time period that we're in and we're gonna be looking at the book of Ruth today. And we're talking about redemption and harvest season, redemption and harvest season. So I might take you guys, if we have the time for it today, through the entire book of Ruth. There's so many good nuggets that I want us to get out of this. Um, but that's kind of what's been on God's heart. And just, you know, it's a story of how God can turn the most impossible situations around for his glory. And we're going to learn that he can use unlikely people. Amen. It doesn't have to come from what you think it should look like in the natural to bring forth the harvest in your personal life, to bring forth these redemption stories, these blessings, these things that you have been believing God for. And what I love about Ruth is it's a great example of, you know, even in the most dire of looking circumstances, God is so in control. Amen. He so got you. And when we choose to honor and to put him first in our personal lives, there is no limit to what God can do. Amen. And so I think a lot of times, most of the topics that I hear regarding the book of Ruth are talking about the love story of Ruth and Boaz. Um, that's not as much what I want to focus on today. Now, we're going to obviously see glimpses of that kind of as we're walking through, but I want to kind of show you more of God's heart for you and your circumstances right now. I want to show you his heart for redemption for you over your personal life, for the things that you're believing for, um, for kind of the instruction that I feel like he's giving a lot of us in the body of Christ for how to approach this particular season, this time that we're in. Um, and so we're going to kind of dive into a lot of that. There's a lot of kind of prophetic parallels that we're going to dive into with scripture today that are going to look at um, what I really feel like God is talking about. And so um, all kinds of good nuggets. I'm super excited to hop into this. Hey, Jennifer. Hey, Sharon. Um, hello to you guys who are hopping on. And I'm going to go ahead and hop into this so that I don't run this long since we got a lot to get through today. Okay, so um, I've got a ton of scripture for us to walk through today. It's going to be very scripture heavy, but hang with me um, because we're going to break this down as we go. And I got a lot of notes on stuff. Okay, so we're going to start very simple. We're going to start in Ruth chapter one, verse one. And it says, in the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. I want to pause there right off the bat. We're really going to kind of digest this slowly as we walk through it today. I want you guys to notice that the famine was in the old place. Amen. It was in a previous season. And so they're in a place of lack right from the get-go when we hit the book of Ruth. This is significant prophetically. Amen. And this is symbolic for a lot of people of what this season of lack looks like in our personal lives. Amen. It's an old order. It's an old season. It's an old form of provision. And so yet they were surviving in it, right? They were in a different land we're gonna see in a few minutes, that was in this land called Moab, all right? And so basically, let's continue from here, but I wanted to point that out because it's very significant. It says there was a famine in the land and a certain man of Bethlehem and Judah went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he, his wife, and his two sons. Isn't it interesting? It says he was of Bethlehem, yet he was sojourning in the country of Moab. So he was kind of displaced. This was not the original place where you would think that this family would reside. That's important. Let's continue, okay? Um, it says that he sojourned there with he, his wife, and his two sons. So we've got several people involved here, okay? All right, it says the man's name was Abimelech, and his wife's name was Naomi, and his two sons were named Malon and Chilion. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem of Judah. They went to the country of Moab and continued there. So this is where the story kind of gets sad. A lot of us are familiar with this. It says, but Abimelech, who was Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with her two sons. So we see, what I want you guys to think of as the husbands in this, um, 
not only represents their covering, it represents their provision. Marriages back in the day, especially in biblical times, you know, women had a hard time earning income for themselves, right? So it represented a place of provision for the family unit, even more so than it does today. Amen. And so basically one of their primary sources of provision passed away. Okay. But they were still okay. They still had two sons to work with. Right. Um, but the first form of provision, Naomi's husband has passed away now in this story. Okay, and so I'm sure there was a lot of grief and sadness involved with this because it doesn't seem like from an outside perspective that this was a bad family situation going on, right? Okay, let's continue. Verse four, and they took wives of the woman of Moab. The name of the one was Orpah and the other was Ruth. They dwelt there for about 10 years. So basically, the two sons went and married wives, Naomi and Orpah. Okay. And once they had married these two sons, they dwelt there for about 10 years. So 10 years in this place of famine, 10 years in this place of lack, 10 years under a previous authority or a previous covering in their personal lives. Amen. This is important because we're going to be talking about seasons today. We're going to be talking about a lot of this really, really good stuff. All right. But let's look at verse five. It says, and Malon and Chilion died also, both of them. So the woman was bereft of her two sons and her husband. Uh-oh, now the women are in trouble, right? Because we've got a situation where all their forms of provision have now passed away. And so, you know, the two sons have died and, you know, Naomi's spouse has now passed away. And so they got a problem right? Because this could represent a life or death situation for them. You know, I don't hear a lot of people talk about this, but you know, again, that there was so much more involved in a marriage back in the day than just, you know, the love factor or, you know, wanting to be with someone. It had so much to do with provision. Amen. And so now there's not only one person who's in trouble, there's three people who are in trouble. Amen. And there wasn't a good way a lot of times for women back in the day to get themselves out of this situation. It was kind of just a hopeless situation in a lot of ways if you're just looking at it through natural eyes, okay? All right, verse six. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law to return from the country of Moab, for she had heard in Moab how the Lord had visited his people and giving them food. So she's being led by the Spirit out of this place of famine, out of this place of lack, into a new land. This is what God is calling a lot of people to right now. A lot of people have been in these very transitionary seasons, or maybe you're not there yet. You've kind of felt it, um, but you are, haven't quite experienced that new place of transition in your life yet. A lot of times you will get stirred in your spirit before you ever see it actually birthed in the natural. And so Naomi felt this stirring in her spirit of it's time to move. It's time to go to a different land. This old authority structure, this old place of provision in my life has quote unquote dried up. I need to go to a new land. I need to be led by the spirit of the Lord to new acquaintances, to new regions, to new territories. And this was what was going on. Okay. You guys following me so far? Verse seven, so she left the place where she was and her two daughters-in-law with her, and they started on the way back to Judah. Okay, so initially, you've got both daughters. I think we overlooked this part a lot of the time. Initially, both daughters were on board. Both daughter-in-laws were willing to go with Naomi to the new land. But listen to this. But Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, go return each of you to her mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find a home and rest each in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them and they wept aloud. Okay, I just want to talk about the significance of this because I don't think that we talk about this enough. Basically, Naomi was saying, if you stay with me, it's a death sentence. Can we talk today? Like, can we have some reality check moments here? If you two, Ruth and Orpah, choose to stay with me, you know, I know that it means that you're not going to have provision. You're not going to be taken care of. You're not going to be able to survive. And so basically, as much as I'm sure it was breaking Naomi's heart in the moment, she was like, you go back to your parents' house go back, see if you can find a younger guy, see if you can find a new spouse that'll take care of you. And, you know, I'll release you to do that without any kind of obligations, hard feelings, whatever. You just go. It's still going to be hard, but you can go and you can do this. The only problem is, and what we're about to read in scripture, is that by doing this, they actually would be going back to false gods. This is so symbolic and so powerful. We're going to talk through this today, okay? 
Um, but basically she said, you know, you've got a choice and this is the choice that Orpa and Ruth were going to be faced with in their personal lives. And one chose correctly, one did not choose correctly. Basically it was going to be a huge faith step for them if they did choose to continue to stay with Naomi and to follow the one true God. Amen. Because it meant risking everything. You know, it meant completely relying on God for their form of provision. It meant believing in the impossible. It meant not seeing how, you know, God was going to make a way, but trusting that God was going to be faithful because they chose to put him first, because they chose to follow God in their personal life. And so it wasn't just a matter of, you know, Orpah choosing to go and get a younger, nicer looking guy or whatever you want to talk that up to, right? This had, you know, very little to do with that. It had so much more to do with, are you going to take a faith step? Are you going to continue to trust God? Are you going to continue to make God the Lord of your life? Or is a little bit of shaking in your life going to cause you to go into a place of sacrifice instead of a place of obedience? Is it going to cause you to go to a place of compromise in your personal life? Or are you going to believe God? Where is the foundation of your faith, Ruth? Where is the foundation of your faith, Orpa? Amen. And so Naomi was giving them, you know, a decision and she was going, you know what, if you don't have the faith for this journey, don't come along with me. You know, you can go marry a younger guy, but it's going to come with a cost. If you choose to go do this and go with foreign gods and go back to your parents' country, you know, yes, you might find provision there. Yes, you might be able to make a lifestyle in a way, but you'll be forsaking the one true God if you do that. There was no in-between. There was no still serving the true God if they went back to their previous country and were about to read this. So that is extremely significant. Um, and it was also heartbreaking for Naomi because, you know, basically this meant she was giving them permission to go so that she could die because Naomi had zero forms of provision. At least the other two could go get married, but Naomi had nothing, ladies and gents, that she could fall back on, you know, because she was a little bit older. And so for her, getting married was out of the question we read in the Bible. And so basically she was saying, you know, rather than all three of us die, quote unquote, from what I'm seeing in the natural, you guys go, you know, go back to your families, go back to these foreign gods, quote unquote, and just let me die. But Ruth was a woman of character. We're about to see this, okay? Um, but initially they both started off with the right responses, but it's in the storm, in that place where your faith is shaken, that you find out where your faith truly is. You find out how strong your faith truly is, not in the place of goodness and the place of prosperity in your life, but in the place of lack. A lot of times that's where you're going to find out where your foundation really is. And that's what these two were about to have to face in their personal lives. Verse 10, and they said to her, no, we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Have I yet sons in my womb that may become your husbands? In other words, again, that had to do with the place of provision. Naomi's going, I have nothing that can help you. You could die if you stay with me. Like in natural terms, you could die, right? Turn back, my daughters, go, for I am too old and I have a husband. And I, I am too old to have a husband, excuse me. If I should say I have hope, even if I should say have a husband tonight and should bear sons, would you therefore wait till they were grown? Would you therefore remain from marrying? No, my daughters, for it is far more bitter for me than for you that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. In other words, she's saying, why should you guys suffer, you know, staying faithful, staying in this circumstance with me where it looks like all odds are against me in this situation? You guys can go get out of this at your decision, basically is what she's saying, okay? Alrighty, this part is important. Then they wept aloud again and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung to her. In other words, I want to tell you what Orpah was really saying here. She took the easy route when she made this decision. She initially started off saying all the right things, but in the moment where her faith was the most shaken, she compromised. And she said, you know what? I'm going to forsake God out of a place of fear and out of a place of convenience in my personal life. And then she took what looks right to her natural eyes rather than relying on the God report over this situation, rather than pressing into God's ability to take care of her. Amen. And so she went after the younger guy. She went to go get married, even if it meant sacrificing who she claimed was her savior. This is powerful, ladies and gents. And kind of sad, actually. 
Um, and so verse 15, it says, And Naomi said, See, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. In other words, Naomi's given Ruth a final chance. She's going, look, you know, she made this decision that she's going to go back into the place of compromise. She made this decision that this journey is too hard for her. She's not going to believe in God to, you know, take care of her. This is your one last chance, Ruth. Are you going to go back with her? Verse 16, And Ruth said, Urge me not to leave you or to turn back from following you. For where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people. This is the important verse. And your God, my God. In other words, she goes, I'm not forsaken God. If I forsake you, I'm forsaking God. And I will be in direct disobedience in this area of my life. And I refuse to do that. That's a woman of God, ladies and gents. And so this is really, really powerful, okay? Alrighty, um, it says, when Naomi saw that Ruth was determined to go with her, she said no more. And what I love about this is Naomi probably got a check from God in that moment of Ruth has proven herself, her faith has been tested, amen? She's proving that she's gonna stick with you. Don't deny her from still continuing to follow the one true God. Amen. Ruth made this decision knowing it could be a little bit harder going in, but she made this decision. Amen. And so you need to honor that decision, Naomi. Right. And so um, I want you guys to understand all of that to say what a huge faith step this was for Ruth. This was not a little thing. This was like blindly stepping out, not knowing how your next bill is going to get paid for. This is what this looks like. This was not only blindly stepping out, not knowing where your next bill is going to get paid for. It was going to a new land, quote unquote, a brand new city, a brand new territory, you know, where they didn't know where they were going to live. They didn't know where their provision was going to come from. They didn't know where their food was going to come from the next day. Amen. And so there was just a lot going on here. Okay, let's continue. Verse 19. So they both went on until they came to Bethlehem. And when they arrived in Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred about them and said, is this Naomi? And she said to them, call me not Naomi or pleasant. Call me Mara, which means bitter for the almighty has dealt bitterly with me. I went out full, but the Lord has brought me home again empty. Why call me Naomi since the Lord has testified against me and the Almighty has afflicted me? Now, this is where Naomi was wrong in what she was calling out in scripture. Basically, she was saying, all the guys in my life have left, therefore God's not with me. The covering of provision, that representative authority in my life has gone, therefore I'm out of luck. I'm out of, you know, the place of blessing. And God's going, no, no, you don't rely on people. Amen. God is coming in to cover you. God is your ultimate covering. God is your ultimate authority over this situation. And where God's covering is, you're still walking in the place of promise. Amen. And neither of these two ladies had given up on God. Hello, who am I talking to today? So Naomi was very much still in this kind of a people pleasing attitude where she was looking to something earthly to stand in the gap and to view as her form of provision in her personal life. If I don't have this person's acceptance, I'm not going to be happy. If I don't have this person standing in the gap for me, then it must all be over. And God's going, no, no, I'm still here. I am your covering. I am Jehovah Jireh. I am your provider. Amen. And so the other thing that she forgot is she wasn't empty. As the scripture says, she wasn't coming out empty. She still had Naomi. And uh, excuse me, she still had Ruth. And this is so powerful, ladies and gents, how God is going to use Ruth in this circumstance. It just blows your mind. There's, there's one line at the very end, and I really hope we can get through this in enough time, that I really just want to talk to you guys about that just, when God showed me this, it was incredible. Okay. All right. Verse 22, so Naomi returned and Ruth the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law with her and returned from the country of Moab. And they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. Now, this is very significant. And this is one of the very first things as I was kind of reading through these scriptures the last few days that God pointed out to me, pointed out to me. They came to Bethlehem. They came to this new city representative of the new provision, a new season in their life. And when did they come? It said during the time of barley harvest. They came during the time of harvest. This was going to be a reaping season for them. And this is what a lot of you guys are about to step into in your personal life, a time of harvest. This switch in location, these introduction of new people into your personal life, these switch of opportunities that are coming to you. It's a harvest season. But what's interesting is Ruth and Naomi didn't even recognize it at the time while they were in it. A lot of you guys 
have already stepped into have started migrating towards your season of harvest of many blessings in your personal life and you haven't even realized it because it's hard to see when you're the one in the situation yourself and then who am I talking to today? They transitioned to this new place in the season of harvest. And what are we in even right now? I don't know where you guys are territory wise. I know we've got a lot of viewers from all over the planet, but right now where I'm at here, it's harvest season. It's autumn. It's fall here. And so this is so symbolic in so many different ways, even in the natural here. You know, I know that's not the case for everybody. But it's really, really powerful. Okay, so they're coming into this new territory, this new season of breakthrough at the beginning of harvest season. Okay, let's keep going. Chapter two. Now, Naomi had a kinsman of her husband's, a man of wealth of the family of Abimelech, whose name was Boaz. So let's talk about what a kinsman is. A kinsman redeemer was someone who, if you guys go look up the definition, and I'd encourage you guys to if you want to do a quick Google search or something like that, but basically these were people who were appointed in the, in the family structure and these different units, men who were appointed to bring redemption after crisis situations, amen, to stand in the gap, to be able to make things right again, and so there was an order in the different ranks of who could be the kinsman redeemer in different situations, right? So they had to go through an authority structure. It wasn't just happenstance who had the ability to do this, amen? And so Boaz was one of these people, okay? Let's continue. And Ruth the Moabitess said to Naomi, let me go to the field and glean among the ears of grain after him and whose side I shall find favor. Naomi said to her, go my daughter. And Ruth went and gleaned in a field after the reapers. <sighs> I love what God showed me about this. This is so cool. Isn't it interesting that Ruth was hanging out with the reapers? She was hanging out with people who had fruit on their life. Who am I talking to today? She's hanging out with people who were producing Amen. She's hanging out around the right kinds of people, hard workers, people who were pursuing the right things. Amen. And so she went and she goes, you know what? Bad company corrupts good character. So I'm going to go find some good people to hang around. I'm going to go find some reapers that I can connect myself with, that I can join myself with, who are headed on the same mission and the same way with their personal lives. And I'm going to connect myself to these reapers. And if I do that, it's going to be a good thing. It says, and she happened to stop at the part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was in the family of Abimelech. And behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem and said to the reapers, the Lord be with you. And they answered him, the Lord bless you. It was not a coincidence that Ruth and Boaz crossed paths. God did it purposefully. Amen. A lot of you guys think that these people that you've been connected with in your life, it was an accidental connection. No, God purposely is putting connections in your path from a job perspective, from a personal perspective, from a ministry perspective, and it's not an accident. Ladies and gents, it's not an accident. It was not an accident that Boaz was, you know, that she was brought to Boaz's field. Amen. To be connected with that specific set of reapers. This was all God ordained, ladies and gents. If you guys knew how much God is intimately involved in the intricate details of your life, you would rest. Amen. You would have so much rest. It's not happenstance. Amen. And so we're about to see this unfold. All right. Then Boaz said to his servant who was set over the reapers, the harvesters, those who are producing good fruit. Amen. Whose maiden is this? So notice God caused Boaz to notice Ruth. She didn't have to go advertise herself. Amen. And that's what happens when you walk in a place of good fruit on your life, when you're a person of outstanding character. Amen. God, the Holy Spirit will bring you to the attention of the people that you are called to walk in alignment with in your personal life. Amen. Isn't that powerful? That could be a business connection, a personal one, a ministry one. But God was the one who got Boaz's attention and he of his own accord noticed Ruth and said, who is this woman? Whatever she's carrying is powerful. Basically, he just was like almost shaken up by this. He's like, who is this? Right? And so verse six says, and the servant said over the reapers and answered, she is the Moabitish girl who came back with Naomi from the country of Moab. And she said, I pray you let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. So she came and has continued from early morning until now, except when she rested a little bit in the house. Now, this is something else that I think is really cool that I wanted to pause and focus on. Ruth, we can see these different characters and characteristics of Ruth coming forth. 
she was a hard worker is basically what this was saying. And Boaz was taking notice. She had fruit on her life. She was bringing in a harvest before Boaz ever hit the scene. Singles, I'm talking to you guys today. She wasn't waiting on the one to come before she started to be productive with her life and find fulfillment and do all of this. No, she had an active full life. She was reaping a harvest in her personal life. She was walking powerfully. She was a hard worker before Boaz ever noticed her and before he ever hit the scene. Amen. I want to just pause here and talk to you guys a little bit about what it means to be equally yoked and come against some misconceptions. You know, the Bible talks about the importance of being equally yoked in your personal life. I think that one of the biggest misconceptions that I hear in the worldly community and in the Christian community is that one person has to be up here and one person has to be down here for it to work well. But I want to tell you guys, ladies and gents, that's not the way a yoke of oxen works. Who am I talking to today? If they are carrying a load, you've got one ox in here, you've got one ox in here, they need to be pulling at the same rate. They need to have the same power behind their walk in order to pull correctly whatever that load is, whatever that thing is, and in order to be equally yoked. Amen. And so Ruth needed to also have a powerful call of God on her life if she was to pull correctly with Boaz to match his vision in order to walk forward into kingdom purpose together. Amen. This is really, really powerful. You know, a lot of the times people will try to, you know, look for, you know, different levels depending on what they've been through in their personal life. But in reality, part of what got Boaz's attention was because he was like, man, this is a person who's on the same level with me. This is a person who I can equally run my race with. Amen. And that is going to have a powerful walk of God as well. And so because she was a hard worker, because the, the word of God moved so powerfully through this woman, through her actions, through her attitude, through her behavior, her loyalty, her obedience, we see all of these different characteristics of Ruth coming forth. Boaz stopped to look because he said, this woman is not like these other ones that I've ran into. She's got something different on her life. Amen. And so this is powerful, ladies and gents. You got to have your own harvest, your own fruit, your own fulfillment in your personal life before you ever meet your Boaz, ladies and gents. You know, gents, you got to be walking in this stuff too. Boaz was successful and was walking in his call before Ruth ever came on the scene. Actually, we're about to read in scripture, if I haven't already, that we find out that Boaz was very wealthy. Now, I'm not saying that's what defines your status as being good or not good, you know, but he had a good work ethic. Amen. You know, he was a hard worker in his personal life as well. You could see the evidence of his walk with God and the fruit on his life as well before Naomi was ever introduced. You guys following me today? These are some additional nuggets. This is not what I hopped on to talk about today, but you know, I'll just kind of leave that there. You guys can do what you will with that. All right. It says, um, then Broaz said to Ruth, listen, my daughter, do not go glean another field or leave this one, but stay there close by my maidens. Watch which field they reap and follow them. Have I not charged the young men to not molest you? And when you are thirsty, go to the vessels and drink what the young men have drawn. Here's the cool thing about this. If Ruth had gone to any other field, you know, women back in the day were sexually assaulted. Like in situations like this, they were very vulnerable. There was a lot of men out there. You know, there's a lot of um, lack of supervision going on. And it was a very uh, difficult situation. And Ruth was taking a faith step to even be out there gleaning. Most women wouldn't have done this. But Ruth was like, I'm going to get provision regardless to help Naomi. I'm not going to let her starve. I'm not going to let her go hungry. This was the character and the power and the fearlessness behind this woman. Amen. She had overcome so much and she was stepping out in a place of faith going, God, I trust you're going to cover me. I trust you're going to take care of me. Even in a situation where normally, quote unquote, it looks like I should get hurt. Amen. I trust that you're going to cover me. And God did. Amen. God spoke to Boaz and specifically told everybody, hey, you touch this woman, there's going to be problems. Amen. And so she's already got this incredible favor. And I want to tell you guys, that was not just Boaz talking. That was God's provision coming to bless Ruth because of her place of obedience in an unlikely scenario where normally she wouldn't have received that. He basically consecrated this field. He preordained this field for Ruth out of all the fields they could have picked. He had divinely aligned this timing, this assignment, so that she could do her work, kingdom work, 
Amen. In a place where she didn't have to fear and where she could rest while she was doing it. How powerful is this? Amen. And also we see that Boaz is kind of quote unquote covering her even before they entered into the covenant of marriage. He's assisting her. He's helping her with the call, with what she is currently called to in that particular season. You guys following me today? Verse 10. Then she fell on her face, bowing to the ground and said to him, why have I found favor in your eyes that you should notice me when I'm a foreigner? Notice that even Naomi noticed that this guy was noticing her. And she's like, why? It didn't make sense to her natural brain, you know, but here it is. It's because of God. Amen. God put that on Boaz's heart to notice her differently. Amen. So let's keep going. And Boaz said to her, I have been made fully aware of all you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband and how you have left your father and mother in the land of your birth and have come to a people unknown to you before. The Lord recompense you for what you have done and a full reward be given to you by the Lord God of Israel under whose wings you have come to take refuge. Wow, powerful words come in from Boaz there. In other words, he's hyping up her character. He's going, you know what? I heard about you. I heard about you, woman of God. There's enormous impact behind what you're doing. I can see it. Other people can see it. And he's going, the Lord bless you for being obedient when you didn't have to be. The Lord bless you for being obedient in a circumstance where 99% of people wouldn't have chose to stick it out. The Lord bless you for continuing to honor him, to put him first, even in circumstances where you could have thrown in the towel, where you could have gone after your own flesh, your own desires. And then he's going, the Lord will bless you for that place of obedience. And that's some of you guys. Some of you guys have stayed obedient through some very hard circumstances and in situations where 90% of the population would have noped out. I want to tell you guys, God sees that stuff. Amen. And you will reap a good harvest in your personal life because it's a spiritual law, right? You reap what you sow. So if you're sowing good seed, if you're staying faithful, you may not have seen it yet, but there will be a good harvest that is produced down the line in your personal life. Amen. I want to encourage you guys today. This is what God is talking about. We are in harvest season. Amen. And what's crazy is they didn't even recognize that they were in it while they had started to step into this season. Amen. Verse 13. Then she said, let me find favor in your sight, my Lord, for you have comforted me and have spoken to me through the heart of your maidservant, though I am not as one of your maidservants. And at mealtime, Boaz said to her, come here and eat of the bread and dip your morsel in the sour wine mixed with oil. And she sat beside the reapers and he passed her some parched grain and she ate until she was satisfied and she had some left for Naomi. Notice that Ruth's obedience didn't just affect her life. It positively affected Naomi's life as well. Naomi was then taken care of as a result of Ruth's obedience. This is good. And when she got up to glean, Boaz ordered his young men, let her glean even among the sheaves and do not reproach her. In other words, don't get on to her for this. She's supposed to be here. I'm proclaiming it. All right. And let some handfuls fall for handfuls for her on purpose and let them lie there for her to glean and do not rebuke her. What I love about this is um, basically she was experiencing getting provision in an unlikely place. Amen. This is not normally something that they would have done. But because of Boaz's command over this situation, because she had favor with God and with men, there was unusual favor on her life. Because of this, she was then able to reap all of this gleaning for the hard work that she was doing. Amen. This, again, none of this is a coincidence. You know, she didn't have favor with Boaz coincidentally. It's because God put it there. Amen. Let's keep going. And she took it up and went into the town. She showed her mother-in-law what she had gleaned and also brought forth and gave her the food that she had reserved after she was satisfied. And her mother-in-law said to her, where have you gleaned today? What did you work? Blessed be the man who noticed you. So Ruth told her the name of him whom I worked today is Boaz. Okay, here's the cool thing. <laughs> it says, blessed be the man who noticed you. I did a teaching with you guys a while back that was talking about let Adam sleep. Do you guys remember that one? Well, a lot of the times when it's not the right time yet in your personal life regarding your love story or whatever it is, or even just a season change, you know, maybe you're supposed to get a job opportunity, whatever, that circumstance will be sleeping. Amen. And you're not supposed to wake it up yet. But at the appointed time, God will cause Adam, quote unquote, to notice you. He will cause that employer, quote unquote, to notice your resume. He will cause those ministry connections to notice you. Amen. At the right time, if you will faint not, if you won't give up, 
God will cause the right people, the right situations, the right circumstances to take notice of you. And that's what Boaz did in this circumstance. I mean, this is so much more symbolic of just a simple love story like people like to paint this a lot of the time. It is important for that. I'm not going to lie. It's encouraging, right? But this has so much more to do with God's provision and his ability to make a way in your personal life over all your situations. Amen. Let's keep going. And Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, Blessed be the Lord who has not ceased his kindness to the living and to the dead. And Naomi said to her, This man is a near relative of ours, the one who has the right to redeem. In other words, God's going to redeem this circumstance. This is foreshadowing. It's a setup. It's powerful. All right. So they're in probably the worst situation they've ever been in their lives. They don't know where their next meal is coming from. They're in a very vulnerable place. It looks like the enemy has stolen everything that he could. He has ransacked these two ladies' lives. He has stealed, killed, and destroyed. It's come against their family name, their ability to carry out their family line, even with children. You know, just about everything in their world has been shaken. But God. Amen. Some of you guys need to be saying that today. Some of you guys, that's what your circumstances look like. You know, the enemy has been pelting you with attack after attack after blow after blow. And some of you guys need to say, but God is my redeemer. But God, God is not finished in my circumstances yet. I will choose to cling to God. And his report is the final authority over my circumstance. And even if I don't see how, even if it makes zero sense in my natural mind, how he's going to redeem this thing, I will trust him. Amen. Let's keep going. All right. It says, and Ruth the Moabite said, he said to me also, stay close to my young men until they have harvested my entire crop. And Naomi said to Ruth, it is good, my daughter, for you to go out with his maidens, lest in any other field you be molested. We already talked about the importance of that. So she kept close to the maidens of Boaz, gleaning until the end of the barley and the wheat harvest. This is powerful too. This is so seasonally symbolic. You guys got to catch this stuff in scripture, okay? Now we're at the end of the harvest season, okay? Think of this as the end of that season where, you know, the produce is coming forth, all of this stuff. We're about to see another season shift. You guys following me today? This is critical. And she lived with her mother-in-law. Then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to Ruth, my daughter, shall I not seek rest or a home for you that you shall prosper? In other words, Naomi's heart was so for Ruth. She realizes what a big sacrifice Ruth gave, you know, to follow her into this unknown land, to do all of this, to hang on to God in this situation. So Naomi's going, what can I do to make this up to you, Ruth? It says, and now is not Boaz with whose maidens you were our relatives. See, he is winnowing barley tonight at the threshing floor. Wash and anoint yourself therefore and put on your best clothes and go down to the threshing floor, but do not make yourself known to the man until he has finished eating and drinking. But when he lies down, notice the place where he lies, then go and uncover his feet and lie down and he will tell you what to do. And Ruth said to her, all that you say to me, I will do. In other words, I wanted to stop here and to point this part out to Ruth kind of had to point this out to Boaz because, you know, Bo Boaz already favored her, right? Like he already knew that she was a woman of God, but he had no idea, you know, that... <clears throat> he was called to be the kinsman redeemer, or even maybe he did know that piece, but he didn't know that that's what they wanted. Amen. He didn't know that that was an honor that they would give to him. And we're about to find out why and a few more scriptures here, but this is why it was so important for Ruth to go and to present her request to him because he was more than willing. He just didn't know. Amen. And so they were having to put it on his radar so that he could then step in as the authority so that he could step in and take over the reins from there. Amen. And we're going to talk about kind of why this is significant too in a second, but I just want to keep you guys following me today. All right. So she went down to the threshing floor and did just as her mother-in-law had told her. And when Boaz had eaten and was drunk and his heart was merry, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of grain. Then Ruth came softly and uncovered his feet and laid down. At midnight, the man was startled and turned over and behold, a woman lay at his feet. And he said, who are you? She answered, I am Ruth, your maidservant. Spread your wing of protection over your maidservant for you are a next of kin. In other words, she's putting this on Boaz's radar. You're the next of kin. And he's, in other words, you have the authority to do something about this, Boaz. Amen. And he said, blessed be you of the Lord, my daughter, for you have made this last loving kindness greater than the former, for you have not gone after the young men, whether poor or rich. Here's what I wanted to point back to what we read earlier about in scripture. You know, Naomi could have done what Orpah did. 
Amen. She could have gone after the younger guys. You know, we kind of hypothetically get the impression that maybe Boaz was a little bit older, you know? Um, and so it was an honor, you know, for him to have been considered by Ruth kind of a thing because he knows the decision she could have made. He knows that she could have chosen to go after another person to cover her, quote unquote, or whatever in this circumstance. And he says, you could have pulled an Orpah. You could have pulled a situation where you went after the young, attractive guys and you just did whatever your flesh wanted, but you're choosing to do things God's way. And he goes, that's an honor that you would choose to trust me to redeem your family line and to help you through this situation. Amen. This is powerful, ladies and gents. Let's keep going. Okay. Oh my gosh. I got a lot to get through and not a lot of time. We're going to get through it though. Okay. Verse 11. And now my daughter, fear not for I will do all that you require for all my people in the city. Know that you are a woman of strength, worth, bravery, and capability. Again, Ruth's character, it's going before her. This is powerful, all right? It is true that I am your near kinsman. However, there is a kinsman nearer than I. So no matter how much, we don't know how much Boaz's heart was in this or if he was just doing the honorable thing. Um, we can kind of assume that probably his heart was in this, right? But he's gonna follow the authority structure. He's also a man of God. So this is his version of checking in with God to make sure that this is good with God, okay? And this is symbolic too um, of what I wanted to talk to you guys about this season that we're in right now. So basically he says, remain tonight and in the morning, if he will perform for you the part of a kinsman, good, let him do it. But if he will not do the part of a kinsman for you, then as the Lord lives, I will do the part of a kinsman for you. Lie down until the morning. Okay. So this instruction that he gives Ruth is critical. He uses the word remain. Now, what does the word remain mean? It means to stay in one place. It kind of means to be still, right? In other words, Ruth, your part's done. My job is to take over now, to check in with Jesus, to go through the authority structure, and let's get the wheels in motion. Now, this probably felt like a time of silence in Ruth's life. Can we talk about this today? There will be seasons of your life, ladies and gents, where God has your blessings in motion behind the scenes. You've done everything you can do. You have believed God. You have prayed. You have waited patiently. And if you're not careful, this is the time where we can be the most tempted to try to take things in our own hands. Amen. We can, you know, try to uncast that care that we have already put on the Lord regarding a situation. And when you do that, it interferes with things in a negative way. Amen. This is why it's so important that we trust God with these blessings in our personal lives. We fully surrender them to him so that God can go through the authority structure and the spirit and the natural, the correct way to bring these things to pass in your personal life. So what's powerful about this is Ruth's job was simply to remain. Amen. And I absolutely love that. And that's a word for some of you guys today. Sometimes warfare is being still and knowing that he is God over your circumstance. What does scripture say? When you've done all that you can do, stand. Amen. So keep that in mind. All right. Verse 14. And she lay at his feet until the morning, but arose before one could recognize another. For he said, let it not be known that a woman came to the flesh threshing floor. Also, he said, bring the mantle you are wearing and hold it. So Ruth held it and he measured out six measures of barley and laid it on her. And she went into town. Um, then she, uh, and when she came home, her mother-in-law said, how have you fared my daughter? And Ruth told her all that the man had done for her. And she said, give me these six measures of barley. For he said to me, do not go empty handed to your mother-in-law. Again, Naomi's obedience is paying off, or excuse me, Ruth's obedience is paying off in Naomi's life as well. All right. Then she said, sit still my daughter until you learn how the matter turns out for the man will not rest until he finishes the matter today this is powerful too so we've heard two important words we've heard the word remain and we've heard the word sit still amen this is what God wants some of you guys doing right now. Some of you guys have acted on everything you can act on. You have petitioned. You have given stuff to the Lord. God's going, sit still. It's my turn. Amen. Sit still. I'm working behind the scenes. Sit still. Keep the faith. Even when you haven't seen it yet, keep decreeing the God report. Keep standing in that place of faith because you are going to see the harvest come forth because it's harvest season. Amen. Some of you guys have got to get yourself in that place where you let your spirit be at rest. Don't get all worked up on the inside. Be at a place of peace because God's got you. Amen. You've got to trust him with these heavy burdens. Trust him with this place. 
All right, so this is the chapter where we see Boaz start to go to work on this family's behalf, all right? So first of all, this is Boaz's way also of checking in with God to get wisdom, guidance, and direction on this situation. And sometimes you need to leave a little space for this in your personal life, ladies and gents. I think that sometimes we're so quick to hop into things in our personal life, and the reason they fail is because we never do a check-in with God. We never go, God, is this your will for my life? Amen. And so Boaz was running this by the correct authority to make sure that he was in the right standing to redeem this situation, to step in and to cover this situation. All right. He didn't just assume, which proves his character as a man of God. All right, let's keep going. Then Boaz went up to the city's gate and sat down there and behold, the kinsman whom Boaz had spoken came by. What I love about this is gates represent a place of entrance and exit a lot of the time. And I think it's interesting that the meetings were being held by a gate. So symbolic of them being about to step into this new season of blessing. All right. And Boaz took 10 men of the elders of the city and said, sit down here. And they sat down. And he said to the kinsman, Naomi, who has returned from the country of Moab, has sold the parcel of land which belonged to our brother Elimelech. And I thought to let you hear of it, saying, buy it in the presence of those sitting here and before the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, redeem it. But if you will not redeem it, then say so that I may know, for there is no one beside you to redeem it. And I am next of kin after you. And he said... I will redeem it. So initially this guy's going, yeah. And think about this kind of from a um, circumstance of there are just some people in need and, you know, they need a way to be provided for. So this other guy who wasn't Boaz was probably trying to do the right thing. He was probably trying to help out a family in a time of need, you know. But we continue reading and we see that, you know, God would not allow this quote unquote transaction to go forward with that particular guy because he wasn't the appointed one. Some of, so many of you guys are freaking out over different situations and circumstances. Well, with what if I get it wrong and what if this and what if that, you know, as long as you're trying to put God first and you're seeking him first, he's going to guide your steps on this, ladies and gents. Just like in this circumstance, the wrong kinsman redeemer did not get this package deal. God's going to make sure that it gets in the right hands, especially if you're praying prayers of God, let your will be done. If you're following his guidance, if you're following his peace, God's going to help you with that stuff, ladies and gents. Okay. Um, I think sometimes we can overthink this stuff a lot. All right. Uh, then Boaz said, the day you buy the field of Naomi, you must also buy Ruth the Moabitess, the widow of the dead man. This line is really powerful. It says to restore the name of the dead to his inheritance. Wow. So here we see the redemptive piece of God coming through. So it's going to restore the old name, restore the name of what was thought to have, you know, definitely going to die out with this family line. And Boaz is saying, this is going to restore their family name. And this is a part of the deal. You don't get Naomi's field. You don't get Naomi without Ruth. They're together. And so this is what changed this other kinsman's mind. And the kinsman said, I cannot redeem it for myself, lest by marrying a Moabitess, I endanger my own inheritance, my own family name, basically. Take my right of redemption for yourself, for I can't redeem it. He's going, I'm officially out. Now it's on you under the right covering, under the right authority, under the right circumstances, and now they can move forward, okay? Um, I'm going to skip a little bit for time's sake, but basically there's an exchange where they made things quote-unquote legal with all of this, and they acknowledged it in front of the crowd. Um, basically, uh, let me see where I want to hop in. And they blessed him. Let me start in verse 12. It says, And let your house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah, because of the offspring which the Lord will give you by this young woman. Again, the family line is continuing. And what you guys may or may not know is the significance behind this is this family line that was supposed to come through Ruth and Boaz would be Jesus's family line. Amen. So critical that God redeemed this situation, right? Okay, let's keep going. So Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife and he went into her and the Lord caused her to conceive and she bore a son. And the women said to Naomi, blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without a close kinman. And I love that they were given God the praise on this. You know, there were some circumstances in the Bible where the kinmen were so far off, you know, they didn't have a kinman redeemer in certain circumstances and those people suffered. But God was covering this family the entire time. And I love that they were giving him the glory and the praise for that. It says, who has not left you this day without a close kinsman and may his name be famous in Israel. Verse 15, this is so good. And may he be to you a restorer of life 
and a nourisher and a supporter in your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you is better to you than seven sons has borne him. This is so cool. So cool, okay? So first of all, the inheritance that Ruth and Naomi were about to receive was so much better than they even thought it would be. Like their minds probably couldn't have comprehended them marrying into this family. You know, Boaz was a godly man, we can tell. He was a prosperous man. He was wealthy, the Bible said specifically, but also he was an extremely hard worker, you know? And so this was a person who not only treated Ruth and Naomi well, we can see that through his actions and his character in the Bible, by, you know, him telling the other reapers, hey, don't touch these women, don't molest them, don't harm them, leave some food behind for them, right? So it's it's a good blessing all the way around. And they got so much more back, even though they had such a hard season of heartache and pain and they had lost so much in a past season, all because they let God do things his way. They trusted him. They were obedient to still choose God when they could have gone after other gods, when they could have done stuff in their own flesh. And now their redemption reward is so much greater because they chose to trust God in this circumstance. What I also love about this is how God can use impossible and unlikely circumstances to bring these blessings, these seasons of redemption and restoration to pass in your personal life. This line in verse 15 said, and may he be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher and a supporter in your own Age, and this is the line that I love. For your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is better to you than seven sons, has borne him. In other words, a woman who was not considered to be a big blessing back in biblical times, you know, was considered to be a greater blessing than even seven sons could have been in the natural. Than even seven people, you know, it was considered an honor and sons were the ones who traditionally carried out the birthright, all of this stuff. But what they were saying in, th in this is, who is better to you than seven sons? And it's because this woman Woman's character was that refined. It was that on point. She was that much of a servant of the Lord that God could use someone who normally could not have helped to carry on this family line, who normally could have done nothing to help to redeem this situation. He was able to partner with something that looked absolutely impossible in the natural to bring forth not just a little bit of blessing, but greater blessing than they even could have had potentially through the natural form, quote unquote, of having seven sons. Don't you tell me God can't do impossible things in your circumstance ladies and gents. It might look one way. It may not be the traditional way that he thought, you know, that, or that you thought that God was going to break through for you, but God is a God of the impossible. He can do whatever he wants with whoever he wants, whenever he wants it. All he needs is your obedience and your willing heart, ladies and gents, and you not giving up in the hard times and still continuing to trust him with that vulnerable place in your personal life and continuing to believe him. I want to read you one last line and then we'll hop off here. It says, they named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David, the ancestor of Jesus Christ. Wow. Isn't that powerful? This was the lineage of Jesus. Amen. This was a powerful, powerful line and God wasn't going to not let this be restored. Amen. So let's apply it back to you guys for a second. I talked to you guys about how this video was talking about harvest. It was talking about this time period that we're in right now. You know, in your harvest season, sometimes you won't even know that you're in it when you're in it initially. Amen. That's what, you know, um, Naomi and Ruth were facing. They had entered the new land. They had entered this place of promise. They had entered this new season and they didn't even recognize it yet. They were just being faithful with the little things day in and day out. I'm going to go glean in the field. I'm going to continue to be a hard worker. I'm going to continue to have good character. I'm going to continue to follow the next step of the voice of the Lord in my personal life. And before they knew it, all of those little steps added up and they ended up in this place of overwhelming redemption, this place of overwhelming promise. I I want to encourage you guys today. You may not see it yet in the natural, but if God has proclaimed a harvest over your personal life, if you have planted good seed, you will reap a good harvest in your personal life. Amen. And God does not forget about his kids. I just want to remind you guys about that today. God has not forgotten about that circumstance that hasn't moved for you in 10 or 20 years. God has not forgotten about that financial thing. God has not forgotten about that health problem. He has not forgotten about that relationship thing that's going on in your personal life. He hasn't forgotten you, ladies and gents, and he can quote unquote redeem your life in an unlikely way, just like he used Ruth. This line said, 
for your daughter-in-law who loves you is better to you than seven sons has borne him. In other words, God used a woman who was supposedly back in the day, you know, the least likely vessel, you know, to be able to be used to bring prosperity, to bring, you know, all of this stuff to a family line and, and all of these different things back in the day. He used her to birth the lineage of Jesus. Amen. As one of the people in the lineup. And so just know that God doesn't rarely, I'll say it this way. God rarely moves the way that we picture him moving in our personal lives because God does the impossible. Amen. And so our job is not to try to figure everything out. Our job is to trust him. You know, I emphasized in that one portion of scripture that we just read out of Ruth, there were two things that Boaz said to Ruth once she had done her part. And Ruth is very symbolic of the bride of Christ of the church, right? There were two things that Boaz said to her once she had done her part, she had done everything she knew how to do. She had acted in faith. And now there was the part that only God can do. He said to her, remain. And she heard the words, be still. Amen. Some of you guys are in that place. You've done everything that you know how to do. And now you have committed this thing to the Lord. And he's going, your job now is to remain, to be still. Have faith, ladies and gents. God hasn't forgotten about you. He is more than able to work out this circumstance for you. And remember that the battle ultimately belongs to the Lord. Amen. So keep the faith. Remember that there is a harvest season that's coming for you. Amen. And God's going to do some incredible things in this season. They were in their harvest season in this story and they didn't even realize it. That's a word for some of you guys today. Amen. Hope you guys have a great day. I'll chat with you again soon.